Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. My guest today, returning to the program, is Professor Job Asiaman. He teaches at the Conservatorium Van Amsterdam. He is known very well for his excellent, excellent book, Harmony Counterpoint Partimento, which is really a very popular book in the Partimento community. And I, a lot of people have been asking me um, to bring him back on because we could dive deeper into that book. I feel like we only really scratched the surface of the book and in the last interview. Believe it or not, it was, in, it was an incredible interview. But now we have the opportunity to have examples and maybe look at some material. So, Professor Asherman, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Nick, for inviting me, and it's a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's a real pleasure to have you. Um, any? Can you give me a little update? How have things been going in the, since the last time I spoke to you? Mm, so that was, I think, one and a half years ago or so. Something like that, yeah. Sure. And, um, of course, uh, uh, nothing changed in the book, <laughs> except <laughs> for some editorial things. Uh, but... Uh, your thoughts about the material are always going on. And uh, uh, now my approach to the book is a little bit different from what it was, uh, let's say, some two years ago. Okay. Um, and uh, sometimes I feel some little irritation or some exercises. And uh, actually, I, I sometimes feel the need to, uh, to, to add some new exercises. Right. And that is, by the way, something that I would recommend to all users. Uh, make your own exercises. Uh, use the book, but also be creative yourself. Right. And um, Could you be specific? And we're going to dive into some examples, but uh, are you talking about... Because your book is divided into sections such as two, two voices, three-part, four-part, and harmonic. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, w what specifically are you referring to? Yes, now more in general, um, there are a lot of schemata that I discuss and um, um, when we go back to the definition of a schema given by Robert Geringen, then actually um, a schema is not something, let's say, palpable in the sense of a sort of material. It's not material, but it is something that happens in your mind. Right. And uh, so when I, for instance, talk about, uh, say, um, now, let me give an example, um, a fenoroli or a quiescenza, um, it is not a thing with a beginning and an end or something well-defined, but it is something in your mind that you recognize. And um, uh, in, in, in various variations, uh, so many variations, Yes. And um, the longer I work with this, um, this, this approach, uh, for me, um, it always becomes clearer um, uh, what it is when you are talking, for instance, about uh, a quiescenza, and when uh, something can be seen as a quiescenza or not. And that de depends on um, uh, your recognition of things, um, and sometimes it can be very hidden, actually, yeah, so right. quite far from the original uh, definition, uh, given, for instance, in the book uh, Music in the Gallen Style by Jeringen. Um, so it is much more something that uh, is something individual. Hmm? And um, when I look at my book, uh, actually there is a little paradox in it, because um, when you talk, for instance, about, uh, yeah, about a, a sequence or... A, uh, something like that, Quiescenza, just to, to keep the same example. Of course, your first presentation is um, a thing. Hmm? So this is a Quiescenza. And I always tried to give more than just one example. But still then, in a book, it becomes something uh, materialistic. 
And uh, the more I teach and the more I think about it, um, uh, the more I try to get rid of that materialistic thing and and, and uh, try to see it as something like uh, uh, something that happens in my mind. But uh, l let's um, try to imagine that we are living somewhere in the middle of the 80th century. And we are working all days with those patterns uh, that we don't... Uh, uh, label as um, schemas or so, but we recognize things because the great masters did it. Uh, my and your teacher showed how to uh, realize bases. Um, so there were no words for it, but um, you had a sort of idea of what was usual in, in the style at that uh, very moment. Uh, so now we are living yeah, two and a half centuries later. Uh, so we are not um, um, working all day with uh, the patterns uh, that were used in the 18th century. Uh, so for us, we, we need to, to see them and to, to, we, we need to define them. But on a certain point, I think it's important to... Um, uh, to um, get rid of the verbalization of the patterns and just to see them, to, to understand them as pure sounds, if right. you understand what I mean. Um, would those pure sounds be um, the counterpoint uh, in the archetype or many, many examples that you have internalized? Yes, I think that's, that's true. And uh, in... Now, just to, to say something about um, the solfeggio method from the 18th century, and, and I'm, of course, referring to uh, the marvelous book of uh, Nicholas Baron um his, um, his um, idea is that um, um, a solmization with its um, uh, diminutions, its um, countless variations, uh, wasn't learned from a sort of schema which you could vary endlessly, but uh, the pupils learned all those patterns, all those diminutions, just as uh, at, at once. Hmm? Uh, so there was not something like an uh, archetype of um, uh, a printer, but there were thousands of printers, <laughs> right. and that's what they learned. Yeah? And um, I, I think that there is something true in that, uh, because in the, uh, for instance, in the um, Sofeji of the 18th century, but also the Partimenti of the 18th century, you never hear something like a printer or so. And of course, the printer is a term uh, coined by by, by Jeringen. but there were no alternative terms. There were no terms. You just had to do. And uh, yeah, in the compositions you can, you can find them, but it, it doesn't sound like a theme or something well defined. So it just happens. Yeah? And of course, what I say, it, it doesn't make it easier actually, yeah? because uh, as a as a pupil, you want to be to have clear forms. Yeah. Right. And that's the um, what the, the the book provides. It gives clear forms. Yeah. Um, but you ask me about my um, approach and uh, the difference between now and let's say two years ago, right. and this, this, and I'm speaking for myself. But this is one of the differences that I um, yeah, discovered actually um, step by step, day by day, and year by year. Um, so I think, and and that is that will be my ideal, that uh, those who are working with. Uh, Partimenti or with schemata, uh, that somewhere um, it becomes something what I described just before. Right. Mm -hmm. Not not very precise this or that, but sort of uh, non-verbal knowledge. Excellent. Shall we shall we dive into your teaching method? So you That's have we've we've prepared some examples. So let's actually get right into. It, I'm very excited to to show this. So maybe we can go to um, the cadence in. Uh, there's a Scarlatti example, and we're dealing with mm -hmm. parallel thirds and parallel sixes. Let's let's take a look at this. This is very nice. So here we have 
Domenico Scarlatti K, his Sonata K eighty um, two. Mm-hmm. Now, what what do you use this as an as a teaching example for? Yeah, so this is. Uh, I just uh, wanted to show a few um, examples of of cadences, and. Um, here, uh, I, I want to say different things about this here. Um, first of all, for me, a cadence is also something like a schema. And so, a cadence is not just a cadence, but it can have different forms. Um, and when you look, for instance, at um, Mozart symphonies or in, in, in Bach or Corelli, uh, whatever, you see um, that different types of cadences are used. Uh, which cannot be described just by the more popular today uh, popular dis- descriptions like uh, a P- PAC or an right. IAC or something like that, but uh, something polyphonic. And yes. um, that is what I wanted to show um, with these few examples. And another thing is what I wanted to show is that is um, you see here uh, the first example is uh, purely uh, in three voices. Um, and the last cadence of the Haydn symphony is also in three voices. Mm. Uh, and only the, uh, the middle example, of Vivaldi, uh, can be seen as a four-part um, uh, example. I, I want to say something about that, but sh- shall we first go through the Scarlatti? Um, yeah. Ex- yeah. Yeah. So if I pl- play that, it sounds like this here. And here, actually, you might say that this is the reduction of the whole example. Mm. Now, what do we hear? Ah. First of all, we hear three voices. And um, I remember from uh, my earlier days as a student music theory and uh, later a teacher music theory, that uh, three part was always something yeah, uh, problematic. It was seen as four-part harmony, because that was the rule, standard, with one voice omitted. Yes. But if you listen to this example, in no way a listener could think of, yeah, it's, it's nice, but actually... It's we missing miss something. One. Yeah. yeah? <laughs> 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 and um, so what happens actually is uh, sort of polyphony. No, not a sort of, this is just polyphony. As this around the uh, the, the, the tonic yeah? uh, and um, this is one of the most um, you know, frequent melodic cadences fa sol mi fa in hexachord solmization yeah? and um, the other voice yeah? makes yeah. a sort of duet with the upper voice yeah? so you might see it as a sort of trio sonata the, 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 the first and the second violin together play this in parallel six and uh, what can you do in the bass? Uh, not so many things, but mm, this will be a nice uh, support of that uh, contrapuntal principle of uh, principle of parallel six. Yeah, yeah? we see that. And um, so, if you look at the, the the second chord of the reduction, uh, so on the B flat, the uh, my analysis of say. 10, 15 years ago would be, this is a two in six position. Uh, so yeah, we're in a two <laughs> that's right, right. Position. Yeah. And, um, but with an omitted uh, note, uh, because we missed the, uh, the, the D actually. Huh? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm, I'm wrong. Um, um, yeah, the D. The yeah. D, the third of the, yeah. 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 Um, but it, the D, I guess, would be the root. No, sorry. Because uh, it's an inversion, right? I, I see. I've for- yeah. completely forgotten my Roman numerals now. So, but but what are you saying when you say this is a Roman number two in six position? Then actually, now I'm I'm charging a little bit. Huh? But yeah. then you say, yeah, the composer wanted to take a second scale degree, but for today he thought that um, <laughs> it would be nice to to do that in a certain version yeah. in in the in, in the first inversion. Huh? And uh, sorry, now I'm a bit ridiculing, and n- none of my colleagues would think in that way, of course. Eh? Of but course. Actually, this is what the symbol tells us. Yeah. Um, 
So, uh, and another thing is that uh, what we see in my example here is that it is a sort of complete three parts um, a harmony or polyphony, if you wish. Yeah? So there is no omission of any tone, it is just what it is. Yeah? So therefore my, um, my analysis will be uh, on the four scale B, which is the B flat, we have a six and that's it. In my earlier years, actually, uh, synonymous with the cadence was one four five one. Yep. And still now, uh, there are a lot of students who say one four five one. That's the cadence. Uh, but that's, uh, of course, untrue because um, <laughs> um, why why do we see here a six chord? Yeah. Not because the composer wanted to take a six chord because or for, for whatever reasons, but it is just here. Yeah. This this pattern here, um, and um, yeah, so the the G above the B flat is a six. Hmm? So it is a melodic figure. So one two seven one yeah, or yeah. fa so mi fa in some in yeah, the, the fa so mi fa is so interesting though, that that when you're thinking of it in terms of the syllable. Yeah. So, so now compare this here. This is the cadence that we see in, in Scarlatti, or that is one four five one, huh? um, and it, it sounds less dynamic yeah, because of that, um, and I'm quite convinced that um, that the reason of this six chord on the B on the B flat uh, has a melodic reason and not a harmonic reason. Mm. Perhaps we can take another example, the, the Haydn um, from the Surprise Symphony, the uh, second movement. Actually, that is almost the same, um, the same idea, actually. Uh, it sounds like this here. Also three parts. Uh, so the, I think that the violas are played together with the cello and the, the basses. And there's a first and a second violin, but there's no fourth part in it at all, mm. at least in the, in the last two bars. And when you reduce it, it becomes something like this here. Yep. Now, exactly the same. And here, crucial element of the melody. So, yeah. very natural. And therefore, there's a D and there's not a C. Right, and that makes a six chord here, or just a six, and um, very um, typical is this movement here. Yeah? The bass is going up a tone, and the upper voice is going down a third. Uh, is the, uh, Professor Asherman, if for someone who's not familiar with classical music, the Haydn mm -hmm. this this reduction is Haydn's symphony. Would you say that that is written in a three-part sort of texture or a four-part texture? Uh, depends. Uh, so the, the first actually um, uh, already in the in the um, uh, the theme uh, from where I took this example, there are some four-part elements and uh, three-part elements. Mm. Uh, so I don't want to say that 18th century music is um, uh, mainly in three parts. Not at all. Uh, but I also don't want to say the other way, namely that <laughs> all music is in four parts. Right. That is a bit the doctrine which you can read in almost all harmony books. And I think that is not true. That's very interesting, uh, yeah. And uh, so the question is, actually, um, do we see three-part harmony or even two-part harmony, but say three-part harmony as four minus one <laughs> four minus two uh, or, <laughs> or, or, yeah or four, four minus two yeah. or do the four part harmony as three plus one right and um now that's an interesting question of course and um i, I don't want to say anything uh, about that in general because it depends on the style and the music and indeed i think that 19th century music is more four part than three part mm. I've, I've never, never examined it. It would be a nice subject, I think, think for an article or so, just to uh, to do some research for the relation between three and four <laughs> parts 
harmony in 18th century music. Hmm? Right. <laughs> Sounds pretentious, eh? but uh, uh, but let me now give an example. Um, now, let me first of all go back to Scarlatti, okay. and then I will give you a little uh, idea of that discussion about three or four parts. So the, the second um, uh, example of Scarlatti is from the same sonata, and it sounds like this here. Hmm? Now we see um, four different voices, if you might say, but yeah. you see that the, the, the tiny notes are not really uh, contrapuntal notes. It is just the note that is from the, uh, the first chord, the C, the fifth, yeah. and it just stays over there, sort of pedal point, pedal. Uh, the real harmony is hmm? in the two upper voices, of course, accompanied by the bass. Yeah? Yep. And here we see that the, the parallel six of the first and the last example are now inverted into parallel thirds. Yeah. So, it is just a matter of yeah, what I call invertible counterpoint. Yeah? So you invert the, say, the, the first and the second violin. Right. Uh, or the two notes in the right hand of the piano. What is, uh, Professor Asherman, what for somebody who is confused about invert inversions, invertibility, what yeah. would you say if a student says, is that the same thing as an inversion? No, yeah, that, that's confusing terminology. An inversion means actually that uh, a third that goes up now changes in a third that goes down. And when you talk about inverted voices or inverted um, count, uh, invertible counterpoint or double counterpoint, then it is just that you change position between the upper and the middle voice or the upper and the lower vo voice. Hmm? So that you turn the whole thing upside down. Right. And so for instance, if I uh, take the first example, parallel six, and now I just move the middle voice up. Hmm? Yep. You have the same relations, but just the voices changed position. And you can really lengthen <laughs> a piece, <laughs> make a piece longer. <laughs> just do it one way yeah, yeah. and then do it the other way. <laughs> yeah, but it's a form of variation, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's also what I sometimes say to my students. If you don't want to uh, do it, the same. It's it's the simplest technique there is, but it is very effective. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, now this is actually th those two examples from Scarlatti are come from a quite a long sonata, and um, I didn't count the, the cadences here, but there I, I think there were fifteen or twenty cadences like this here. Right. Right. And they right. they sound in different uh, keys, and they they sound in different inversions, uh, so like here. Uh, so upside down, and uh, you never have the idea that uh, that Scalati is repeating all the time. But the, the point, of course, we all know the examples of um, of the inventions of Bach, the two part invention. That's two point. Yeah, that's two parts. Uh, but uh, now you might say that sometimes it's a sort of hidden three part texture, eh? so right. it's not always really two part. Yes. But just go to a solo sonata from the Baroque time. Hmm? Let's say Handel. In my book, I gave uh, a couple of examples from Handel flute sonatas, very nice examples always. And um, of course, you have to um, accompany the flute part also with a harpsichord. Yeah? So, uh, and, and the harpsichordist plays uh, two part chords, three part chords, or four or five part chords, perhaps even sometimes six part chords, depending a little bit on the uh, dynamics that he wants to play. Yeah? So, piano or forte or fortissimo, um, but um, if you just play, perform the uh, a flute sonata of Handel by a flute and a cello, and that's it, it sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, it's full, it's complete, actually. Yeah. And so uh, the, the, the chords added by the uh, harpsichord player are additions and make the sound fuller, but the essence of it is two part counterpoint. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yes, two parts, three parts, uh, and of course also four parts. I read in me... the, uh, Professor Asian, I read in the, I can't, where is it? I had a Brahms, this Brahms biography, 
And apparently, like I read an anecdote where if somebody gave him a new comp- composition to just look over, like a fellow composer or mm-hmm. a, a junior composer, I heard, I, I read that he would take his fingers and cover the middle voices and just look at the bass and the soprano, which I thought was, that's really interesting. He's in the 19th century and he's got that bass and that melody orientation. Yes, yep. If you that is also what what Schenker um, um, uh, obs- observation was. Yeah? So actually there was a sort of Außenstimmensatz, as he called it. Uh, so that the basis of the harmony is between uh, the melody, the upper voice, and and the bass line. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, and right. that is not so far from a thorough bass idea, actually. Yeah. Great. Um, so I, I can imagine that Brahms, yes, indeed. Uh, but what to think of Beethoven? Uh, Beethoven sketches. You see so many uh, basso continuo like uh, sketches uh, with this <laughs> figure bass numerals, um, and no, no Roman numeral actually. <laughs> it, yeah, the bass was melody. Yeah, right, right, right. That was the way they but were thinking. Here, in the Scarlatti, I would say it is mainly three parts, like in a trio sonata. And is that the Italian style? Yes, you might say, but the Italian style was became a sort of universal style eh? because uh, the Italians uh, um, took all the positions <laughs> of uh, the <laughs> best positions courts everywhere in Europe. Right, right. That's perhaps why they were also very much appreciated by the Germans and the French. So because right. the Italians took the best positions. So Italian style actually you can find it in Bach and uh, and in Telemann and, and everywhere. And, right. and Handel, of course, not to forget. Um, but uh, when we continue with the discussion about uh, three or four parts, I think that uh, the example of Vivaldi is uh, quite instructive. Shall we go to that? Absolutely. Yeah. So you see some tiny notes, and <laughs> um, uh, actually they should have been notated an octave higher, but uh, then it would be a bit of a mess in my notation, so therefore I notate it in that way. But uh, I'm going to play the example, and I'm just omitting that those, those tiny notes. Okay. Um, and so the upper voices you hear. You again hear a duet between two voices um, in parallel thirds, and when I play that together with the bass, it sounds like this here. Mm, Right. When you look at the the viola part, so in the tiny notes, you see that um, yeah, that that part is not very melodic. It makes some leaps, um, not very convenient. Uh, it's um, filling out the chord, as you said. So the the vo- viola part is of course a very important uh, part, but it doesn't add so much to the uh, contrapuntal idea of the composition. It's a filling voice. It it makes the harmony sounding better. But the most crucial, I think, are the two violins and the bass. And when we look at the end of the example, uh, so when the thirds go down, they are accompanied by the bass. Hmm. Um, So what we hear is a movement in parallel thirds and the bass that um, gives a contrary motion to that, uh, that, uh, these two upper voices and they together form the harmony. Now, here again, um, uh, don't try to find complete harmonies. Yeah. The harmonies are complete, but not in the sense of um, complete triads or six chords or so. Now, it's uh, just what it is. Now, Professor Asherman, do you teach cadences very early on in the book? And is this kind of near the beginning part where you want to show two voices, thirds, sixes, and that sort of thing? Actually, yes. Uh, now, not at the very beginning. Um, that is just a choice. But um, in chapter three, and um, I'm teaching that chapter somewhere starting in January or so. So um, beginning of the second semester, after some eight or nine lessons, then we start talking about cadences. 
And before that, we um, focus more on stepwise motion uh, sequences. And therefore, the, the usual cadence was always stepwise. Uh, for instance, um, this here. Hmm? Or. So the last was a suspension, which I call the compound cadence. But in chapter three of the book, uh, then I, uh, I actually I spent a whole uh, chapter to the cadence, and um, I discuss uh, several forms of a cadence, and this is one of them. Uh, so in parallel thirds or in parallel six, and um, I call that the gallant cadence, because that's a cadence which is perhaps um, the most frequent one in in the whole gallant style. Actually, mm -hmm. you might say from the, the whole 18th century. Yeah. Um, perhaps uh, so. If we um, take this example, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, is that now? If, if that I'm, in the music in the gallant st uh, gallant style, the Cudworth would that be and yes, the indeed, Cudworth? yeah. And and yeah. do you tell them? Do you teach the schemata names and ask students to be aware of them early, or do you just let the sound and the, the examples just fill their ear, and you don't really want to overload them? No, so I, I'm I'm a bit um, careful with introducing too many terms. Yep. So the Cutworth cadence is something for you and me, but not for my students um, in the first year. I think that that would lead too far. Yeah. But what I wanted to show here is uh, here also the, the parallel thirds are the leading aspect of the whole cadence. Right. Yeah? right. Uh, so that is something that is very typical of the, the style. Um, another thing is, and I actually perhaps these are the two basic forms that I teach here, is um, when we go back to music of the 15th and 16th centuries, uh, the ur type of a cadence is this year. We have two voices, a tenor voice, which is doing three to one, and the upper voice is one seven one. And there's a suspension. So it doesn't matter what piece you take from the 16th century, whether it is Josquin de Pre, Clemens no Papa, or Lassus or Palestrina, almost all phrases are closing with this uh, formula in two voices and other voices can be added of course yeah, it can be in a three or four part or even five part setting but there's always that three to one or the one to one perhaps and the one seven one motion the one one seven one is called uh, cantisans uh, that means that the the pattern this year is something that you mainly here in the soprano voice or in the cantus and the the two one is a voice that you usually hear in the tenor it can happen the 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 formulas can occur in other voices too but on important moments in a piece in a motet for instance you will almost always hear the cantisans the, the clausula cantisans in the cantus or the soprano and the clausula tenorisans in the tenor or the, the tenor. Yeah, so uh, composers are of course free, but at the end of a piece, or just somewhere at the end of a section, you will almost always hear those two voices with those two formulas. And when you add a bass, for instance, now you hear a bass one, five, one, added to those other two voices. We call that clausula basisans, or the bass cadence. Yeah? And there's also an alto cadence. And the alto cadence is just a filling voice. It just fills, and not so much more than that. Now, um, another way of adding a bass to that two-part formula is this here. Or so 
but that's a very polyphonic pr principle that goes back to the 16th century or even earlier. But now let's go back to the 18th century and let's look at doesn't matter what symphony, for instance, of <laughs> Mozart. Um, now, it's quite curious, but just a few days ago, I gave my students uh, an assignment about the Jupiter Symphony. And I asked them just to um, discover between a, a couple of bars uh, all the cadence formulas. And I, I can tell you there are a lot of cadences in Mozart music, much more than you probably think. There are many, <laughs> many, many. And often a theme can be closed by a succession of three or four or five or six cadences in a row. And they all sound different. Yeah? So there's never a sort of boring dual moment. Yeah? Um, and I think the answer on that question is, so, yeah, so discover those cadences and what cadences are they? They're almost always of the type that I just played. Of almost always starting with the three, three, four, five, and then the third, which is typically 80th century. Yep. Hmm? In the 60th century, you would end with a perfect consonant. Right, right. In the, in the Partimento school, uh, this was called uh, a cadenza composta. Yep. And uh, Jenninger uh, translated it into a compound cadence, and that's the term that I use for that too. Right. Yes, a compound cadence, which means that before the final tone, there is a dissonance that results into a consonance. And so, dissonance, consonance, and then the final relaxation. Now, what you see is that Mozart, uh, at least in the Jupiter Symphony, but in many, many other pieces, is almost always using this pattern. Yeah, so this this pattern that has its birth somewhere, now I think already in the music of Landini in the Trecento in, in the in the 14th century. So it's a wow. very old principle. Wow. And um, it is still still unbroken. There, uh, Corelli almost always uses this pattern here, uh, and there are more patterns than this here. But the the the, um, the essence is actually that compound idea of a seven that goes to a six. And that goes to the octave. Yeah, so, seven, six, octave. Now here, once again, uh, I would say, so often those cadences, also in Mozart's Jupiter, are often just three parts and not four parts. Really? Though, okay. Wow. And we hear a whole orchestra. Yeah? And if there is a viola part which doesn't play together with Celli, for instance, mm -hmm. you can always see it is just a filling voice. And the essence is just the three voices that I played on my keyboard now. Um, so That's really yeah, interesting. So you're it, saying like um, someone is a genius like Mozart. He is using three voices, not like um, four minus one, basically. He's using it as a real expressive vehicle. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Sure. And here too, uh, so the uh, the. Yeah, traditional way of labeling uh, the dissonant chord here yeah, would be a two in six five position, right? Um, and let's now not talk about the fact that this should then be uh, an incomplete two in six five position, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, but with labeling it in this way, you lose the contrapuntal context completely. Yep. Because the contrapuntal text, uh, uh, texture is, uh, the context is the seven that goes to the six and then to the octave. This is great. I mean, that that's just the, the, the first document, but you've given a lot of nice ones. Um, shall, we, shall we jump around? What do you think, Professor Azerman? Yeah, perhaps to the second one, because that's a bit in line with what we are talking about now. Perfect. Uh, real three-part harmony. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed, so the fake, real three part. Yeah, yeah. as opposed to the fake uh, three-part harmony. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so in, in no way thinking in four voices. Oh, I have a quick question, actually. Um, yeah. Do you draw, you said, yeah, you can grab any symphony from, from Mozart. Do you typically take your examples from uh, chamber music and orchestral music, or do you like keyboard music, or do you have a preference when you look for your examples? 
No, I strive for a maximum variety, actually. And so um, uh, not only in styles and composers, you know, styles, of course, mainly 80th century, beginning 90th century, but um, um, not only Mozart and Beethoven or Haydn, but um, as, as many composers that I had in my mind. And uh, not only chamber music, uh, but also symphonies. So, I, so I to you, to the, there's no real, like, I mean, obviously there's different instrumentation, but the, the, the whole idea is still in the, in, in, it's still present in almost any setting, essentially. If you're looking for a kind of a topic, you can find it if you want, almost in any kind of setting. So if you look for a particular idea, um, you, you, you can find yeah. it everywhere. Oh, yes. Yeah, everywhere. That's, an, so that's really interesting. What we, are, what we are talking about can be found in piano sonatas, can be found in trio sonatas. Of course, it depend, depending on the style and in a Corelli sonata, you will find other things, of course, than in a Beethoven sonata. But the, the patterns uh, where we are talking about now actually are sort of universal, at least um, in, in the common practice periods. Great, great. That's really great. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the next example, uh, you already showed it on the screen, I see it. Uh, so the, the real three-part uh, harmony, uh, that's also from a, a Haydn symphony, now an earlier one, uh, so-called Mercury symphony, a very beautiful one. And um, it, it's a symphony in E flat major, but here we have an excerpt from the development of the finale which is in C minor actually, not, not the finale, but this fragment. Okay. And let me first play it. I, I will play it a bit slower, just to make it clear. So a very short fragment, eh? but uh, what we see here, Actually, we see only two voices, but if you look at the right hand of what I played here, of course played by the, the violins um, in, in the score, um, they do this here. Oh, it's like a compound melody. Yeah, actually, you, you hear two voices. Yeah. Two yeah. voices. Yeah, so. And here again. You hear a progression of a sevens that goes to a six, yeah. seven, six, seven, six, yeah, and there it stops. Um, and you might see that as the the core of the whole harmonic uh, setting here. Uh, so no. You put X's. What are those X's? Yeah. So uh, I just wanted to show the the changes of the harmony. Okay. Um. So in the first two bars only. Um, one harmony per bar and then each half bar a new harmony um, when you translate that into a let's say undiminished uh, form huh? just the other way around or the <laughs> reduction but the, the reduction of this uh, this this excerpt then you get the the example below and that is this So Beautiful. harmonically speaking, this is exactly the same as uh, the, the the original example with all those eight, in, uh, eight, uh, eight notes, hmm? and there are only three parts in the score. Actually, two parts. Hmm? Yes, uh, if you count the, 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 the upper part, can yes. be seen as, of course, yeah. uh, essentially two parts. Hmm? So this is a three-part example, and. Of course, when you um, take a lot of time, you can find everything. But I can tell you, I, I can assure you, you don't need to look for these kind of examples. They are everywhere, omnipresent. Yeah. Right. Right. And um, here, in my opinion, I would say that the um, uh, the essence of the harmonic movement is not so much the bass line. And of course, let's not even speak of a progression of chords, yes, <laughs> or inversions. But it is actually the the seven six progression in the upper voices. Mm, that's I see that as, as the as defining sort of, sort of yeah, yeah, the, the the main principle. And um, when you look at the bass, 
uh, the base accompanies that by uh, descending thirds and ascending seconds. And so down a third, up a second right. would be uh, the definition given in Partimento books. Yeah? Exactly. Uh, but it's good to realize that the bass could also be different. Yeah. yeah? So um, if I play once more the, the lower example, I could also find another bass. Yeah, so let, let me try to vary the bass in another way. Mm. Did you hear that? So my bass was different now. But the two upper voices were exactly the same. And what you see uh, in the example, you see some... Uh, Figured bass numbers, yeah. six five. Uh, I mentioned, and the five three uh, are implicit already there, of course. Uh, six five actually just means uh, on the F in the in the third bar, um, you see a D and a C above the F, and that's mm. it. Uh, so there's no information about chords or so, but just happens on the F. There's a D and a C. So a six and a five, and that's it. And then next, there's a five and a three, and then it repeats six, five, etc. <laughs> so when I uh, do the other example, what I played uh, as a sort of little experience, then uh, now this chord here, what I play now, and I'm not aware of that what I'm playing, but when I look at my fingers, I see a nine three chord. A nine three, and nine just means a ninth above the base. Yep. the The meaning of it is a suspension, but it doesn't doesn't say anything about the chordal function or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. That, that's I different. think that's clear. Huh? That's that's really that's really nice. Now, uh, how would you suggest somebody uh, learn those different ways to accompany the melody? Is there is there ex many examples to kind of build that ability to look at a melody line and change? this is counterpoint actually right I mean this is really but in a in a in a 18th century way where your have your orientation is towards a kind of a gallant sequence or a gallant under uh, language. Yes, um, that's true, and I would say that that um, language can be continued until. Yeah, Schubert Schumann, um, and uh, I have one example of a Wagner example, so we will come on that perhaps yeah, later. Yeah, 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 that would be exciting, yeah. Because <laughs> you, you say uh, in your book that you go all the way through the common practice uh, era, which is really in interesting, because a lot of people think Partimento and Thorough Bass, oh, for instance, Thorough Bass has this bad rap that it's only for Baroque, and it's only accompaniment. And Partimento, maybe it's just 18th century and then it's, it's dead. So, but you're saying a lot of these, this language extends on into later periods. Yes, uh, but I, the, the, um, one of the reasons that I started to write a book here was not that I wanted to write uh, methods for Partimento playing. Because I think that when you want to learn Partimento playing, then I would say, play Partimento. <laughs> hmm? <laughs> uh, so uh, that's another sort of sport you might say and uh, right. uh, what I do I, I use or if you wish I abuse sometimes uh, partimenti and I also take over some elements of the um, educational practice of that time uh, right. so therefore the subtitle of my book is not uh, a method in partimental playing but it is a new method inspired by old masters Right. So that that makes the way free for me just to 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 use the models mm, of those 18th century uh, teachers um, for actually um, a subject which should be taught um, at conservatories. I think uh, at least uh, much broader than just the 18th century. Right, right, and that's so, really great that you do tackle the later styles because that I think is one element that make, makes people excited about the book. Um, the, shall we go on to, uh, well, I think the third thing, the third document you sent me was thirds and sixes. 
Um, yes. Should we go into that one? Yes, that's a good idea. That's a yeah. good idea. Okay, so let's go into that one. Thirds and sixes after Durante. Now Durante is uh, 18th century, but let's let's take a look at this. And can I ask you a question? Are these examples in the book? Um, this book here is uh, this example here is um, is in the workbook. Yes. Okay, so if people buy the book, they will find these examples. They this will is find great. This, yeah. and this is great, and, and you can explain it for them. Yeah, yeah, you can find this uh, exercise in in the workbook in the first chapter, so in the very beginning of the book, and it is an arrangement of a partimento by um, by Francesco Durante, who is a contemporary of Johann Sebastian Bach. And interesting here is that, um, um, yeah, actually it is mainly um, intended for two voices, at least in the context that I place it. And um, here there are some elements of Vivaldi, the way how it starts. And all the do it unisono. And don't don't think in terms of harmony, but just unisono, like so many yeah. uh, solo concertos of Vivaldi. And this is also the way how it ends. And it works if you just go through it quickly. It works like a ritornello. It 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 always comes back and it um, connects different solo passages. And so in bar five or so, it starts at tiram pam piram pam param pam pam. That this sounds a little bit like a solo. And then the ritornello comes back and think of a whole orchestra. Hmm? So this is just a very simple partimento, but it has so many things in it. Um, and um, actually, this is an exercise that I ask my students to do after having had some two or three lessons. So imagine that uh, our school starts it on the 1st of September. And then uh, somewhere in the third or the fourth week of the same you month. You throw this at them. <laughs> they, they make this, this uh, example right. of this exercise. Now in the other um, file, you find a little recording, a video. Yeah, so what we now see and hear are two of my students, uh, Fatima and Herman, both first year students. And they play uh, this on the violin and on the cello. What I think is very important is that um, each note that you write has a meaning. So uh, you have to to experience what you write, because if you don't hear it, then it is just ink on paper and it doesn't have any musical meaning. And the problem is, of course, that not everybody is playing piano very well. Yep. And um, uh, it, it's, um, I think, very important that they learn to, to sing it or to play it on their instruments. Right. And actually, it's always fun. So uh, when we are doing things like this here, uh, then everybody is happy, actually. Yeah. It's, it sounds good. It, it sounds much better than on the piano uh, because of the melod melodic uh, load of, of the, uh, the exercise. Do they find it difficult to try a partimento by Francesco Durante so early in the game? This, I no, this was not something that uh, my students found very difficult to make. Uh, because they exactly knew what to do. Um, at the previous um, chapter to, to deal with parallel thirds exclusively or parallel six. And now we make combinations of it. And that's the only thing that they have learned. 
but with that limited um, yeah, use of material, you can already make mu a beautiful music. And of course, my arrangement of the Durand Appartimento was first of all to make it much shorter because it was really long. Right. Um, but also just to uh, get rid of all, all um, yeah, cadences with a, a three, four, five, one bass or so, because that is something that I had uh, to introduce later. And so for everything that they learned so far, just in the, in the two or three weeks, they they are able to make something like this here. That's fantastic. That's wonderful. Yeah. Okay, let's let's jump to perhaps uh, fifth down, fourth up. Yeah, that's the next example, and also quite in the beginning of the whole method. And that is an exercise that uh, students can make somewhere in November. Let's say after six, seven, eight weeks or so. Wow. And um, in the video that you can see now um, is uh, you will see um, a group of singers and they uh, sing this um, exercise which is based on a trio sonata by Corelli. And actually I have to say that I only needed to change a few bars um, because it was too advanced for the period in the method, uh, but this is almost the whole um, um, piece from the trio sonata. I think of opus two number, no, I've forgotten the number, but uh, in his opus two, um, the gavotte is the basis of this um, this exercise. And I didn't need to change, um, no, I only needed to change a, few, a very few things. So here you see uh, many more schemas in comparison with the first one because uh, each lesson you might say that students learn a new schema or a new um, sequence or whatever. Uh, here uh, it starts with a fenerolli and the fenerolli is a pattern which has a sort of canon structure in itself. Um, so uh, when I play the beginning I repeat, if I repeat this pattern, you hear the canon, and there's also a middle voice that stays always on the same note. On the yes. Front. That is uh, one of the uh, Jeddingen definitions of what Fenerolli um, uh, is. Um, I never talked about the Fenerolli before, but what I sometimes do, I already introduce a schema, and I show something about how to realize it, and then later on in the book, I will come back on that and I'll um, give it a complete discussion. And the reason for that is that I think that it's good that something already nestled in the minds of the students before you really go into the depths in your discussions. And so there is always a sort of yeah, introduction of something and that leads to um, a thorough discussion and then it will repeat many, many, many times after it. Right. And so, uh, Fenerali or Fifth Down, Fourth Up is not only something of chapter two, but until the very end of the book, you will hear Fifth Down, Fourth Up and Fenerali and, and these kind of things. 
Um, so that that about this um, exercise. It's a beautiful one. I think fifth down, fourth yes. up, or fourth yes. up, fifth down. It's one of my favorite, especially with the sevens. <laughs> so beautiful. <Yeah. laughs> one and, of. Uh, I think I may say that this is one of the perhaps well the, the most beautiful examples of ex exercises in the whole book, and I may say that because <laughs> I've stolen that from Corelli. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so wonderful. Um, now, this like for instance, we didn't never talked about this, but the Phrygian half cadence. I just want to ask you a question about that. And uh, a Phrygian cadence is something that you might uh, encounter in a situation like this here. Yep. <laughs> and perhaps you recognize something of the end of a first movement of Sonata. Yeah. <laughs> and then the next move will be an Allegro. Yep. Yep. So what happens here? First of all, it's a stepwise cadence. And the bass is taking a half tone step, a fa mi in hexachord solmization. Mm, the fa mi. The uh, peaks of fa mi. Eh? Fa mi, and on the fa you always have to take a six chord. In this case, with a suspension. So, and for us it sounds like a half cadence. Eh? Yeah. And now there's one little problem, and it is that a half cadence. Um, now, um, in the early 18th century, nobody spoke of a half cadence. That seems really. Um, a, a concept or, or or a term which didn't exist. Really? Okay. Wow. So you could speak of a um, uh, um, stepwise cadence, indeed. Um, That's interesting. I never thought about that. So I just use the word half cadence all the time. I, they yeah. never they never really had a term for it. That's no. Interesting. It's, wow. Yeah. I, I don't want to be uh, too snobistic, and uh, so. <laughs> But to my early music students, I always say, yes, now we talk about the half cadence, but remember, this is not a concept known by uh, early 18th century composers or theorists. <laughs> but actually, what you sometimes see is, um, and I, uh, don't ask me for the exact sources, um, but um, uh, what you sometimes uh, read is a cadence that stops before the uh, ultimate, or on the pen ultimate. Right. Yeah? So that is uh, what we now probably would call a half cadence. And um, in this one here, in when we go back again uh, to uh, the sources in the 16th century, for instance, this was just a cadence, as so many others, but with one big difference, and that is that the, the tenurisans, uh, so in this case the lower voice, uh, has a half tone step. Right. Yeah. And uh, that makes that you cannot uh, raise uh, the leading tone, so because then you will get something like this here. Yeah. Mm. And so in 16th century style, this would just be a Frisian cadence, or more precisely, a, a mi clausula, because it ends on a mi. <laughs> and that's the that's a nice way to look at it. Yeah. A, a mi. Yeah. Um, we often say that, uh, uh, mention of, um, label that as a Phrygian cadence, but that's not completely right because this can also happen, for instance, in the Lydian mode. Hmm? Ah, so well, they, they did. Okay, so I have a question there. Is the did they think in terms of modes in that sense, uh, in compositions? Mm, uh, no, I, I don't see any. Um, reason for that. Um, when we talk about the early 18th century, it's good to, to know that the, the major and minor system, as we know it, yep. is not um, so established as we probably think. Mm. Um, because there, there's a whole century be, uh, in between the, the modal uh, system, so to speak, it's yes. not the system, but the, the modal world of the 16th century. And the the, the major and minor, the tonal world yeah, of, of <laughs> Heidegger and Mozart. Yeah. Uh, still in, in Bach, you find some traces that, uh, yeah, that, that go back to a sort of 17th century <laughs> approach. Now, I think it's a bit beyond the scope of our discussion now, yeah, yeah. but 
But that's very cool. No, no, I, I think it, it, it's 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 very interesting, and and I'm glad you're giving that extra dimension to it. Um, mm. But what wonderful, yeah. This is document seven, and you yeah. says discant cadence, um, and we it's kind of ties into what we were talking about, right? We were talking about Phrygian here. I see it shows up, but tell me about this discant cadence and where it shows up in the book. Yes, um, now it's it's in the beginning of the the second part of the book. And that is uh, completely um, uh, devoted to four-part harmony. When I started to think about uh, four-part harmony uh, from the perspective that I've taken uh, as my uh, starting point, um, that was uh, quite difficult um, because four-part harmony, uh, um, the, mi the middle voices in four-part harmony, yeah, because of the, the, there are two voices in the middle hmm? and they are much less transparent than in three-part harmony because you ju just have one. And I think that our ears are completely um, um, uh, suited to hear three voices, but four voices with two middle voices is quite problematic. And I was a bit afraid that, uh, that uh, students, when we started to think about four-part harmony, that they, they would forget everything that we talked about voice leading, etc., etc. Right. So uh, I really needed to, needed to take a time out of I think three or four months, and as so often, uh, the solution of the problem came at once. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, I I found uh, the solution in Bach. And um, I remember that when I was eight or nine years old, um, one of my first pieces of Bach was a little prelude. That sounds like this here. I, I will play a little, just a little phrase of that. Okay. Now, I think that everybody who plays piano has ever played this piece yeah. here. <laughs> they had to go uh, through that. It, I found it lovely, and it is a fantastic piece. It's, it's actually it's a masterpiece, because here it, it's a it's a little prelude for for little fingers, but it is also a sort of solo concerto with um, 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 ritornello. But interesting is here um, there are four parts uh, sections in the piece. There are three parts and even also two parts. Uh, so I thought yes, bingo. That's the way how to, to introduce four-part harmony, not as four-part as a whole, but just as little exceptions. Yeah. And so um, here in, in this exercise, uh, a quite simple one, I just um, introduced the discount cadence. Uh, you already said something about the, the leading tone in the bass here, which you yeah. can see quite, quite well here. Yeah. Um, and that is what you might call a comma. In in, right. in the chronology of uh, of Bob Jerningen. Um yeah, but you can also see it as a sort of cadence, and it sounds like this here, and then in the inversion, yeah, yeah, and so forth, yeah. and then we go over in three voices, and then again in four voices. Now, can mm -hmm. you scroll a little bit? Uh, now, I just played here uh, the Bach Prelude. Here, this is a Fenneroli Partimento, and this was a little gift, actually, because what do we see? We see a simplified Bach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Isn't that wonderful? wonderful. Yeah. Uh, I have to be honest, uh, the, the, the upper voices in bars 1, 2, and 3 are mine, but also you might say Fenneroli's, because... Um, in bar one and two, you see slow, long notes, values, and then uh, alternating with uh, quicker ones. In the terms of uh, Bob Jerninger, this would be called boring and then exciting. Inter yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in interesting, interesting. Yeah. Yes. And uh, that's a sign that you have to, uh, to, to make imitations or hear invertible counterparts. Yeah? So in the upper voice, and this is one here. And now 
Now I take bars one and two, the base of bars one and two in bars three and four. Yep. And that is the the framework of a of a cadence of a compound cadence in four parts. And then we continue with, now you see we start with two parts and then four parts and then again two parts. And then it, at the end of this page here, uh, we continue with three part harmony. Right. And so that makes us much more, um, yeah. It naturally, in, it, 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 it kind of comes into the music making in a more natural way rather than, like you said, the whole piece, instead of thinking of everything must be four voices, you're inserting it in very gently and making and it makes sense just like his box piece is it, he he does yeah. that yeah sure yeah so um yeah That's i was wonderful. very happy that i i found that link actually and for me that that was the the the, the sign that i could go on with this uh, but i mean it, um in music education before they used to say that Oh, you never, you never lose, get rid of the voices. You know, I mean, if it's if you start with four, it's four all the way. Um, but, but is that? I mean, is that for chorales only, or I mean, how does that? Is is that is that specific to like a, a certain kind of uh, composition? I mean, so students get in their mind, oh, I must do four. It's got to be four all the way. I can't drop out. And but I noticed that now there's a lot more flexibility in the middle of the composition. Yeah, that's of course a bit of dogma that you always have to write for S A T B, hmm? and that was of course based on the chorale um, setting, uh, but not um, let, uh, yeah, music is not always chorales, hmm? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also in, if let's say if if you write for a string quartet, then sometimes the viola or the cello has a rest, right? And so yeah. Um, That's it, such it, a big point, but I mean, it's 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 not commonplace, not common knowledge, I guess. It just it's, it's such a huge, huge. No, that, that, that's important. That, that if, I think that um, now I have to be a bit careful with my. Um, uh, but if if I look at a, a let's say such a traditional harmony book, uh, the dog, dogmatic way in which four part harmony is taught, it suggests that that's the only truth there is. The only truth. <laughs> that's a dogma. <laughs> I, I don't want to say that, that my approach is the only truth. Absolutely not. And I don't dare to say that three-part harmony is the harmony of the 80th century, because I, I, I don't know that so well. But uh, the other way around, saying that all harmony is, in essence, in four parts, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's not true. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And... Um, yeah, so I think that um, exercises like this here, or the Bach, Bach prelude, or actually almost all music, proves that. Right. It can right. also it can also be five parts. Yeah. yeah. This here mm -hmm. is a five part piece. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, that's right. Yeah. Um, okay. There's a one more document which I'm very yes. eager to get to, and this is boom right into the 19th wow. century now. now wow. <laughs> we go right into the 19th century, and that is uh, you say that in your introduction, which is we're going to tackle Brahms. Uh, I mean, it can you tackle everything as much as you can? Um, so here we are, Tristan, and I see the rule of the octave. Can you explain what's going on? Yeah, so actually, the Tristan. Um, Four spiel, or at least the first couple of bars, are the blueprint of romantic harmony. <laughs> and when you say romantic harmony or a twist on four spiel, then uh, there's some sort of uh, uh, frightening, difficult. Um, and um, actually, there are a lot of explanations of this, uh, these first three bars of the piece. And... Um, um, one, ex uh, ex uh, one uh, explanation is more complex than the other. It's, it's incredible what they always find uh, found um, in history about these couple of bars. First of all, um, the uh, bar one is actually one voice, just one yeah. melody. And I would uh, propose to to keep it melodic, not harmonic. So why would you always harmonize things that we have? So, um, 
in, in my version here, in the where, where I use the rule of the octave, I place it in tiny notes, but I don't want to see that as the harmonization of bar one. Hmm? I, I want to make a comparison. And so bar one is just one voice, not more and not less. And then we have uh, now the famous Tristan chord. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, it should be much slower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then this here. Um, now, um, about that uh, Tristan chord, yeah, so the, the chord that you see here with the G sharp in the top. Yeah. Uh, sounds indeed quite um, yeah, uh, ambiguous. Yeah, so mm -hmm. you don't know actually what it should be. Um, but perhaps in retrospect you can understand it. So when you have heard also bar three, then probably you might think, okay, now I understand bar two as well. Um, now, I don't want to bother you and the listeners with all the sorts of explanations that uh, can be found in the... Section no, bother us. No, no, after no, no. The, after the, the Tristan uh, chord. Bother us, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> I just want to uh, to stay with with my own comparison with the rule of the octave. Okay. And um, perhaps I have to say a few words about the rule of the octave. Actually, it should better have been uh, labeled the rule of the um, realization of a scale. That's the rule of scale realization. Step and that wise, means yeah. that, um, let's say, if you have an A minor scale, If you see that, then your right hand has to know what to do with that. Hmm? Or on the way back. Hmm? That is the more classical one, you might say. Yeah, yeah the Fenerolli one. Yeah. Um, Students, uh, the, the apprentices of the 18th century, were supposed to learn this by heart with their little fingers, uh, 13, 14 <laughs> years old, eh, in all 12 major and all 12 minor keys. Uh, so that was one of the, the basic um, skills that you had to learn when you wanted to play on the keyboard and wanted to play Partimento. Um, I sometimes call this the holy grail of classical harmony because when you know this rule, I think that you can understand some 70% of all classical pieces, at least in harmonic aspect. Incredible. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, the rule of the octave disappeared in 20th century books on harmony. You don't find any word of that. But it makes the life of students so much easier when they know what to do on the first or on the second or on the fourth tone of the bass scale. <laughs> and of course, it's a little bit limited because right. it's only in stepwise motion. Right. But um, um, I know that my, my students are talking in the canteen uh, between lessons with other students and they show something of their application of the rule of the octave. And other students are sometimes really surprised. Is it that easy? And the answer is, yes, it is that easy. Um, so um, now back to, to Wagner. Um, so many um, authors uh, after Wagner wanted to believe us that um, there was something magic in, this, uh, in these three bars. Oh, no, you're going to take away the magic. <laughs> no, I, I don't <laughs> Completely take it away, but uh, okay. <laughs> it, it is about magic. <laughs> uh, but um, actually, um, we have to know that uh, Wagner was taught by a pupil of uh, Stanislaw Matei. And Stanislaw Matei was, a, in his in turn, um, a pupil of uh, Padre Martini. And um, Matei stood for Partimental school, uh, sequences, um, suspensions, uh, cadences, rule of the octave, all those things yeah, that, uh, ah, there we have. Um, so uh, a pupil of Matei was educated with all those 
things. And I think that the rule of the octave um, was always in the center of the attention. Now, I'm almost 100% sure that uh, when Wagner was a pupil of a pupil of Matei, yeah, so there was one stage in between, uh, then he must have learned the rule of the octave. And partimento playing in Germany and at that time, yeah, so we, we speak of the, let's say, the first 30 years of the, the 19th century, partimento playing was yeah, just something that, that not, perhaps not everybody, but many, many people did. Hmm? And um, so I think that we can be sure about the fact that, that Wagner knew the rule of the octave and one of his basic features. Now let's look at the, uh, the rule of the octave. Mm -hmm. Right. Of course, this is not the same as the Tristan chord, but if he would, let's say, if we go to bar three, then there's no doubt we all would hear the A sharp as appoggiatura for the B. Mm, right. Yeah. And now let's say if we do the G sharp in bar two in this way. Hmm? <laughs> I think that everybody would at least re recognize this uh, this six four two uh, sorry six four six, three four. chord on the six scale degree. So that was a rule. When you had to go from the six to the five, you had to raise the six. In this case, yeah. the D to the D sharp. That was just a rule. And everybody did that. Haydn did that. Um, Mozart did it. And almost always. And not sometimes, but almost always. And so it's uh, a long appoggiatura. It's a long appoggiatura, yes. <laughs> At least that is what I would, uh, that, that is the first thing that I would say about this here. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, I'm open for other explanations, but this seems so simple. And so, yeah, so, so. I mean, it looks uh, very close. I mean, it looks basically, other yeah. than the G sharp, it's yeah. the same chord. <laughs> so. yeah. The only thing is that, and, and, and that's a little bit the magic, uh, later on in the Vorspiel, we will hear this chord, and then the uh, D sharp and the G sharp are enharmonized into an E flat and the A flat. And then we, then we hear something like this here. So, yeah, so this chord um, with the G sharp, eh, so the second bar of the Tristan Vorspiel, is, in my opinion, an appoggiatura chord. Mm. Uh, but later on, Wagner uh, treated it as something yeah, independent, so uh, the, the G sharp as a, as a chordal tone. So that, that makes it indeed more complex. Interesting. Uh, but that is only in bar 88 or so in the Vorspiel, much later. Right, right. Oh, yeah? that's, that's that's incredible. Wow. Uh, um, actually, I, I, I did uh, some, uh, last year, I, I did this Vorspiel with a group of students, uh, second year students. And um, we went on, no, not like this here, but we went through the first page of the piano uh, setting, uh, the piano uh, uh, reduction. And uh, I had the idea that uh, yeah, there were no secrets for them. That they had a sort of <laughs> that is amazing. Wow! <laughs> and if there was a secret, that is because the 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 the, uh, the music itself is for is so so yeah, magic, you might say. Yeah? Can, can, uh, Professor Asian, can you say something about the nineteenth century and how you uh, like you said no secrets? How would you talk about someone like uh, Schumann, Brahms? Wagner here, are you saying that, um, what do they do differently in the 19th century that stands out to you? Ooh, that's a very difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, first of all, it, it makes quite a big difference whether you talk about Schumann or Brahms. Um, so I think um, now Schumann actually, for me, uh, stands quite close to the Gallant style in the way that uh, the the patterns, the, the schemas that you you can recognize in the 18th century, are still used by Schumann very very often, and uh, the only difference is that um, yeah he is adding some 
um, some ornaments in it so that the chords sound a little bit more um, yeah, ambiguous or so. Uh, but in essence, uh, it's quite close to, um, or not always, but often quite close to, uh, to 80th century models. I have uh, a few years ago, I wrote an article about um, um, Gallen schemata and their uh, survival in, in early 19th mm -hmm. century. And I focused on Beethoven, Schubert and Schumann. And I, I don't want to, to claim that um, uh, Schumann is just a sort of gallant composer, not at all. Mm. But you see uh, in his, yeah, I, I see a lot of um, connections, actually, let me say it like that. Right. In Brahms, Brahms less. Um, and I always, so... Uh, we, we should write a book about Brahms and uh, <laughs> why Brahms sounds like Brahms. Because uh, every music lover and, uh, just has to hear one note of Brahms and he or she will immediately understand this is Brahms. Um, and I think it has something to do with um, yeah, so ornamental tones uh, mm. around his harmonic structure. Um, but I, I find it quite difficult to, to say something about Brahms in uh, relation to what we are talking about now. Right. So f for me, that is th that that will be a little bit in, uh, 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 a magic. <laughs> in your book, uh, who is the latest composers that you tackle? Now uh, Brahms, one of them. Um, yep. uh, Tchaikovsky, uh, Gounod. And then, can you tell me about them in relation to schemata and just the system, the new system that you talk about, looking at someone like Tchaikovsky and Gounod, uh, what's your impression of those two? Now, um, um, so the example that I give about, uh, give of uh, Tchaikovsky is about a typically 19th century schema called Omnibus. Mm. In the 18th century, it already existed, and in my uh, last ex uh, chapter, I show um, an, um, an, uh, an example of, of Haydn, which is really a marvelous example from his Abschied symphony, his farewell symphony, it's, it's really wonderful. Uh, it's very chromatic and very enharmonic. And so everything that you think of 19th century harmony is in that schema. Wow. Um, Sounds a bit like this here. Etc. And then you can continue all the time. Yeah? <laughs> um, very uh, chromatic. And um, you see that quite often in, in music of, for instance, Franz Liszt, but also in Tchaikovsky. And an example that I took is from the, from the fourth symphony, uh, sorry, from the sixth symphony. Um, so that's very late in the, in the 19th century. Um, and but that schema has a has a, a history actually that goes back to the middle of the of the 18th century. Uh, what you see quite often is that a schema can be discussed in terms of a uh, raise and a summit and then a sort of decline. And uh, here too, yeah, so uh, first of all you will hear the omnibus. Uh, by the way, called in the 18th century Teufelsmühle, which means devil's mill. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but they already recognized it in the, in the 70s of the 18th century, so they already named wow. it. Yeah. And uh, but it was quite infrequent. And um, in the time of Liszt and Chopin, now uh, you find it very often. Hmm? <laughs> it became very popular. And uh, now perhaps uh, Tchaikovsky's uh, Sixth Symphony is perhaps one of the latest. So. Um, yeah, that, that was about Tchaikovsky. Um, well, wonderful. I mean, uh, to end off, Professor Asherman, can I, I'd like to end off on maybe some, how, how do your students now, it's been another year and a half, two years since we spoke, and you were talking, you said something interesting that you want, you are fine tuning it in a way, the way that you were teaching. Um, mm -hmm. And how are the students reacting to it? And can you just give me an idea of like, do they like it? Um, I'm, I, know, I know that there's always students that come to you who have a different way of thinking 
And those that have to change, how do they feel? Do they feel like, oh, this is good or, oh, this is too big a change? And you must have seen all the reactions. So maybe you could give me some uh, some insight into that. Yes. Um, now, uh, it's always difficult to, sp- to speak of the students <laughs> in general <laughs> because everybody has his own um, yeah, attitude. And, um, but it was interesting to see that um, in the beginning of this year, I started with a group. Uh, seven students, so we we, 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 we teach in small, small classes, so seven, eight is already sort of maximum, and we have a lot of time for uh, for, for those classes, so that, that's a, a good situation. Uh, but I had, uh, so seven people, in the, seven students in the class, from seven different nationalities. Wow. And um, uh, they had one thing in common, and they already had some harmony classes in... Um, the, I would say the most be hatred form, uh, so uh, very mm. functional and, and the Roman numerals and, and, exactly. and uh, vertical vertical thinking. And their first reaction was yes, but we do it completely different in, in our <laughs> own country. And then my standard answer is always yes, but in Amsterdam we do it in this way. <laughs> but um, it was interesting to see that uh, somewhere uh, there was one student who started to complain a little bit. Do, do I have to change my whole system? And yeah. then um, before I could answer it, uh, a sort of discussion uh, came uh, arose in the group, and that was really a wonderful discussion. And, and uh, uh, they just tried to uh, define an answer on why they uh, should change in in their um, uh, at least in, in, in respect to to harmony classes. Right. Um, and um, actually, everything that I wanted to have said uh, to that student is what they said. Yes, but this is much more about our instruments. They were all uh, brass players, by the way. Uh, it's much more about our instruments. It makes more sense because it's more linear. And yeah. uh, these kind of answers came up in the group. And uh, I, I didn't need to say anything about that. Uh, uh, of course, this is not a guarantee that every do, but, uh, right. everyone is doing well. And of course, there are a lot of other uh, things that that deserve their attention. Uh, what to think, for instance, the trumpet lessons or the trombone lessons. Eh? Uh, but that was a nice, uh, nice discussion, and for me, a fantastic uh, feedback actually, it's, uh, because I, I I didn't write it for myself, but it, I wrote it for my students. And their reaction was really making me glad. I have a different reaction is um, someone who is older, a professional, a faculty member, maybe mm-hmm. not from your conservatory, but maybe others. Um, yeah. how, are people set in their ways? Or do you find that even people who have been using the, the, the I guess, the 20th century way, um, are they... Easier because if you're younger, maybe this is newer. It's easier to adopt something that is if you're younger. But for somebody who has been doing the 20th century way for a very long time, have you mm-hmm. found that people are like, ah, oh, this is too much, or I like it. I need to drop everything and <laughs> and try this new thing. I'm going to throw away 20 years of experience <laughs> and uh, and try. So how about for older colleagues? If we would live in an ideal world, yes, everybody would <laughs> drop everything out of his hands. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's not true. And yeah, I, I, yeah. Uh, first of all, I, I don't want to um, uh, give any pressure on anybody to to uh, to change minds, eh? because yeah. uh, of course uh, you you can uh, talk about music in a very um, uh, sensible way uh, with with the old system, and that was also how I, I grew up. Yeah. And, so of course the the the, uh, the reason why I started to write my book was a pedagogical reason, but when doing that it also changed my mind very very much. But I, I cannot um, expect from my colleagues that they would indeed uh, drop their system, which was successful for them at least uh, for the last twenty years or so. Mm. Now, what I see now in, uh, not so much in Amsterdam, but uh, in other conservatories in the Netherlands, that um, uh, some conservatories um, uh, take my book as a compulsory book for for their first and second year students. Wow. And I, that's, that's a wow moment indeed. Yeah? So that, <laughs> wow. That's really cool, yeah. 
Um, so I mean, that's not an easy decision. I mean, uh, I mean, that's it's a difficult decision because there's so many great textbooks. I mean, you can argue about it, uh, which is better, but there are a lot of established books out there. And um, to choose this one, which is, I guess you see, like you said, a new system on based on old methods. Um, I mean, it's it's kind of a validation. Yes, and I think that the reason why they do that um, um, is that uh, they recognize um, um, the problems of the of the old system uh, and, and old in the sense of the 20th century system of the, the vertical orientation of everything and um, when your own orientation is more melodic then um, it is difficult to be um, uncritical to those uh, books uh, I remember from my uh, from years and years ago that uh, students uh, sometimes ask me we learn everything about harmony but why why don't we learn anything about melody yeah and, uh, yes there's you're no right. textbook there's no textbook you're right. for that. yes you're right <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and now uh, in, in, in my book they learn something about melody yeah so right. i think that we, is that is recognized by others too we have to i am sorry to keep bothering you you keep coming on my show but we have to bring you back and we must dedicate a whole show to solfeggio, I think, would be a wonderful thing. Um, <laughs> but I'm sorry, I know you're a busy man, but uh, <laughs> with, with conservatory duties, but let's try it. That would be wonderful. I know the, I, I've been getting that request from audience members. Like, Please, let's do some solfeggio with Professor Asia, and that would be awesome. So maybe in the future, let's, let's come on and, and do that. And I just want to plug this incredible book before we end. Um, here it is, Harmony, Counterpoint, Partimento, a new method inspired by old masters, Professor Yob Asherman. Uh, final thoughts? Do you want to just mention any projects or anything? Is there anything you want to just mention you have planned or anything? No, um, planned. Actually, um, um, when I'm having more time, more free time, and I'm just a little bit close into my retirement, then uh, I still have in my mind to write a sort of the same book about Renaissance counterpoint, but <laughs> that, that, that's actually a secret. <laughs> oh no, that's a, that's a, that's a okay. huge, now, wow. Now it's a public secret, but. <laughs> Big exclusive on my show. <laughs> so that's going to be, a, whoa, that's epic. So we're oh. going to have a, a Renaissance, wait, so you can't just say that and then not say anything. So uh, are you planning to, is there some issue with the way it's taught that you want to change it or or how what's what's the reason for for that book um now nah, the, the point is that um, um what i think is really important uh, when you are um, practicing renaissance counterpoint is that you try to understand how um, musicians were thinking in that time now it's much too pretentious to say that I'm going to tell you how 60th century musicians thought because it's very difficult to, to say anything about that. There are some beautiful books written about that, for instance, the book uh, uh, Performance of, the, uh, of 60th Century Music of Ann Smith, a wonderful book, and there are more books about that. Uh, but for instance, the whole matter of, of modes, uh, what mm. is the Dorian mode actually? And there were also beautiful books and texts written about that, but I didn't find that in a sort of real um, counterpoint method. Uh, so, um, um, like in my book, Harmony Counterpoint Partimento, I am using research and um, articles and books by others in order to form a method to st for students. And um, this is something that I have planned to do, but it's uh, a, a five years project or so. Five years, okay. Well, I, <laughs> <laughs> I will remember yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Professor Asherman, it's been a real pleasure to have you on the show. Again, really thank you for spending so much time and, and talking to me and going through the examples. Please buy this book. A lot of people highly recommend this book especially if you're into Partimento, which is why I'm assuming you're watching this show. So, I mean, I have a copy. I use it. Please check it out. And uh, Professor Asherman, thank you again. And I hope to talk to you soon.
Thank you. And thank you too, Nick. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you.